The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Uh, it's nice to be back on this uh, sort of stage uh, to talk at the next decade of my life about things that I've done in the past decades of my life. And uh, this book came to my attention uh, through uh, the uh, NPR, oh, there it goes, okay. The NPR uh, program um, in the morning, you know, with Joe Donahue. And uh, he read a review, and he, he uh, interviewed, I guess, the author. Uh, Susan Faludi is a well-known author in the 21st century. Not before that, <laughs> but for all the notions of femininity and her, her uh, seminal work, uh, particularly uh, on uh, the undeclared war against the American woman, the betrayal of the American man, uh, myth and misogyny in an insecure America. Some of her titles. She's a very dynamic writer. I mean, you read her and you're either angry or you're saying, right on, right on. You know, it's that kind of thing. And in today's times, uh, we need those kinds of people to generate the energy to overcome the uh, uh, downward trend in uh, forward thinking in the United States. Anyway, uh, this book um, is a rather complex book. Um, for how many people have read? How many people have read the book? Okay. Um, if you notice, she divided it into three sections. It's a biography of her father, who became a trans woman at the age of 76. So I mean, there's always hope for somebody who decides they don't like their own biology to change their biology. It used to be said that anatomy is destiny. Well, we now have proof, uh, without a doubt, that you can alter some of the anatomy. Not that it imp improves your lifestyle necessarily, but it does change some biological characteristics. Anyway, the first part of her book is getting reacquainted with her father. Um, this is a man, a very iconoclastic. Uh, he was uh, basically a, a touch-up photographer. Those are the people who would use Photoshop to doctor up appropriate uh, photos, you know, putting, say, uh, uh, President Trump with uh, the gal who just died of, uh, I forget what she died from, maybe an overdose, but she was married to this millionaire. I don't know if you saw that story. And um, uh, here's a picture of Trump meeting this woman uh, in, uh, before he was, even considered uh, or considering the presidency. And of course, if you take that kind of thing and put it in juxtaposition today, you get all kinds of innuendos about who this man was 20 years ago or 10 years ago. That kind of thing is what the father was well known for. And he worked for IBM, among other things, as, as well as um, um, Time, the Time Life books. Remember those magazines, uh, Life magazine, and they had these wonderful pictures. Well, he could touch, he could touch them up, so that they really looked more dynamic than they were. Some of them were just basic photos where you put one image over another image, and then by the magic of uh, the darkroom, um, you could create a whole different aspect of that photo and its implications. In any event, uh, in 2004, uh, Susan gets an email from her father saying there have been changes in my life. The father is now living, uh, he's no longer living right now, but he was living uh, in Budapest where he was born. And he was born basically in the interim between the two world wars. And um, uh, Susan had been estranged from him because he left about 25 years ago to pursue other things, leaving his family, and was not heard about or from for another 15 years. So she was rather surprised uh, to hear from him. And uh, the information that she got was that I have changed my sex. 
and uh, I am now a woman. Uh, in the email, uh, that's what she says here. So she was um, at once uh, both curious and, of course, um, uh, how do you describe it? She, uh, she was uh, not plagued. What's the word? Um, perplexed. Thank you. I knew, it, I knew it had P's in it. But she was perplexed because this man, uh, in her earlier years when she knew him, was very macho, sexist, typical, uh, autocratic, uh, um, and also a pheno a phenocentric uh, individual. Uh, he was very stentorian in his home, uh, treated his family like they were part of uh, a, uh, a tribe that he had uh, total control of. In any event, he has invited her to come to Budapest, where he's living, and uh, uh, she accepts the offer, and that starts how the uh, book begins. Now, this book, is at least eight years in the making. <laughs> if you think authors just have these things on the back of their head, some do, but most don't. This book took at least eight years because Susan um, um, was not only interested in what happened with her father and how, why he changed and all that, but why he decided to live in Budapest and, rather than coming back to this country. And um, then there were questions about why did he have a sex change? Uh, after 76 years on the planet, why did he decide then maybe it's better to be a woman in the society than to be a man? She had uh, all kinds of theories about this, but she really was ignorant of, about his motivations. So she goes to um, Budapest. And she doesn't, uh, first of all, he sends her a very cryptic photo because she doesn't know what her father uh, looks like as a woman. Uh, and he had lots of earlier pictures when he was a cross-dresser or whatever, uh, but they were not relevant to meeting her or him at the airport uh, where uh, she was destined to go. Uh, the second phase of the book uh, is the part that I probably will focus on in, in this, this uh, uh, talk today, um, because it's a study that she did, uh, and not a formal study. She was trying to unravel what would motivate her father to do this kind of uh, uh, change in, in his life at this point. And so she uh, investigates a lot of the history about gender diversity and sex reassignment surgery and some of the major players in the 20th century about this particular phenomenon. And so I will spend some time talking about that. And um, the third part of the book has to do with the journeys of Stephanie. That's the name that the father has chosen, his femme name. And um, in parts of the book, uh, the, the name Pista comes up. Now, Pista was his pen name, not a pen name. Uh, it was sort of like a uh, uh, slang term for Istvan, where in Hungarian, Istvan is the term for Stefan. Uh, uh, you could go from Istvan to Stefan to Stephanie uh, without too much difficulty uh, in the local area that he was living in. And you go to find out, as you start to read the book, uh, a lot of the past of this man is following him. That is, he is not out of the woods just because he changed his sex. He is not uh, clear about what direction he wants to go in, yet he is living in a role that gave him a lot more privileges than he already had before the Second World War. And uh, the, the author then goes into some of the history of what happened during the uh, 40s and 30s when he was living in Budapest with his family. <clears throat> and this is a part of the book that I found most fascinating because it gives you insights, because I've never read d detailed histories of the, war, uh, the interwar period in, in Europe uh, at this, after the Germans uh, lost the war along with the Turks and the Austro-Hungarians um, in 
1917. But from 1919 to 1933, was known as the interwar period, and it was a famous treaty at Versailles. Um, in Europe, it was known as the Treaty of Trañón, which was the palace in Versailles. But um, we know it as the, pa uh, the Treaty of Versailles, in which Germany had to make enormous reparations. Um, it was trying to emerge as a new kind of dem democracy with lots of problems from the aristocracy as well as the disgruntled people uh, who uh, uh, lost the war. And it's not, not uncommon in those days to find scapegoats that could easily uh, justify why we lost the war, why we gained the war. And in the book, it's, it's filled with those anecdotes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anecdotes of what happened, and I will read, you know, selected uh, excerpts of this to give you a flavor. If you haven't read the book, um, of how she uncovers some of these things. Uh, first, uh, I think, in under and the third part of the book, of course, is what happened after the end of the Second World War. Because in the end of the Second World War, he has to confront all of the issues that he avoided, or not avoided, how to protect himself and his family uh, from the vagaries of the Third Reich and um, the uh, ensuing uh, fascist regimes, both in Hungary, uh, in the Soviet Union, and how they control the destinies of post-war Europe. So. Um, let me um, read a little bit of this because uh, what it does is gives you uh, an idea of where I'm uh, talking. He has sent the email to his daughter and um, um, she has a picture of him um, in this thing. His hand is on a jutted hip, uh, pantyhosed legs crossed, one ankle over the other, I looked up at the photo on my wall, men can't get in touch with their femininity, which was a picture that was sort of uh, uh, mystical for uh, Susan because that's, she thought that was the typical feminine pose and that's what he thought. But uh, she was not aware of what was behind that. And then as a child, uh, uh, Susan recalls, uh, I had resented and later feared him when I was a teenager um, and he left the family, or rather been forced to leave by my mother and by the police um, after a session of escalating violence. Despite all this alienation, I thought I understood enough of my father's character to have had some inkling of an inclination this profound. I had none. So she really is perplexed about why he might have done this, uh, but he's invited her to come to um, Budapest and learn about uh, some of the rationale for this change in his lifestyle. And uh, in another section of the book, um, early in, in, in the, the writing, uh, she says, um, in the first instance, he seemed to be heeding the call of an old identity that no matter how hard he'd run, he'd failed to leave behind. In the second, she devised a new one of her own choice or discovery. Um, anyway, she was looking at reasons why her father might have done this, and one is that he was trying to escape all of his past life and history. Um, he was born in a Jewish family, a very wealthy Jewish family, and then during the period after the First World War, uh, the Jews in Central Europe were a very powerful group, not politically so much, but economically. And where everybody else was sort of uh, trying to um, recover from their own economic troubles, these families uh, controlled the destiny of a good part of the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, of which Hungary was one, uh, Czechoslovakia was another, uh, Romania was a third, and so forth. Uh, all of this part of Central Europe, which uh, later on Hitler claimed was all part of Greater Germany, and that's why he would invade first Poland, then move down into Czechoslovakia, and then onward into Austria-Hungary, and so forth. And um, he was born in 1927, so that was the era of the interwar period. 
And this was a period, probably one of the highlight periods for the Jewish communities who were living in that part of the Austrian Hungarian Empire. Uh, first of all, economically, they were doing very well. And they were really in uh, league with the nobility of the old empire. <clears throat> because they could pro provide economic wherewithal to keep the uh, idea of nobility in Hungary alive. And um, soon after the uh, uh, first of the uh, uh, issues with, with the uh, Treaty of Versailles, uh, the, uh, they carved up all of Central Europe. So one part became Czechoslovakia. Another part became Romania. A third part became Slovenia, and so forth and so on. So all these states that are now independent states or semi-states uh, were all part of the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, including uh, parts of Serbia and parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So um, this is the background upon which this person is growing up. and. Uh, uh, because uh, his family is very well off and uh, the Jewish community is very well placed in Budapest, he is educated into the uh, realm of what it's like to be a, a, a Jewish, uh, um, not a bureaucrat, but uh, a mogul in a way because they had everything economically that other groups did not have in Central Europe after the war. And uh, he talks about his uh, life uh, as a uh, student in the gymnasium, which was in Budapest, and it was one of the most reputedly uh, academically um, placed ones in all of Europe after the war. And a lot of it was focused by his uh, parents and uh, the people who sent their kids to this school. They were all extremely well off economically, and they were the basis for the post war culture that developed all over Central Europe and spilled over into Vienna and then spilled over uh, into France and the other parts of post-war uh, Europe of the First World War. Um, there are some other uh, passages that I think are uh, interesting to, to at least quote here. Uh, she talks about um, um, entering his house um, he's living in an old um, estate um, that was part of his family's legacy before uh, the First World War, uh, but then was taken over by this, uh, fascist governments and also ultimately by uh, Germany as it uh, tried to uh, conquer all of these places in, uh, in Hungary. And uh, he recouped that as part of the legacy, and, uh, and he demanded return to that property, even though he hadn't lived in it for about 30 years. And so he, uh, she goes with him to this uh, home, and it's it, it's security uh, over over uh, overworked. So there are, there are locks to get in and locks to get out. In other words, you can't just open the door and go out. Uh, you open the door to go in, and then as you close the door, the lock to go out is also put in place. Then you enter the house. Uh, this is a, an estate that was gated, and uh, uh, she remarks, uh, it is fascinated this need to reconcile security and self-display. The house must show its feminine lacy moldings, leggy balusters, its delicate attention to detail, its sinuous sweep of steps, yet it must also show its teeth and muscular locks and unyielding ironwork. It must be at once coy and assertive, like hissing peacock, a thing beautiful and ridiculous. What is perhaps characteristically Hungarian about uh, these green belt houses, these kitsch castles in the Buda Hills and the Pillars Hills by Lake Balaton and um, another place in, around the Budapest area, is the conflation of exhibitionism with high security. It is akin to the confusion of the feminine and the masculine that is a feature of the language. 
And um, here she's beginning to get the sense that um, there are all kinds of contradictions uh, to her father's past, his present, and his choices of how he to want, wants to live. Uh, he has stopped being the uh, uh, photographer, uh, uh, photoshopper that he was for most of his professional life. And he, they talk about his life uh, in Brazil as a major cartographer when they were doing the uh, a mapping of the contours in the 40s and 50s of the whole of the uh, state of Brazil. He, he traveled to these places as a professional photographer and uh, did all of the contouring work that uh, was necessary to build these maps. Um, and he talks about that later on in here. Um, another passage that is of interest um, is uh, the, the uh, uh, gender of pronouns um, that uh, he uses. Um, it, it, when she talks about her father, she always says, my father, she. Uh, which is an indication uh, that she's not quite sure how to deal with this person. Uh, uh, she's pretty clear that it is uh, biologically uh, connected uh, with her father. Uh, at the same time, she's dealing with a, at least a superficially strange person who she knows in one sense but doesn't know in another sense. So the book is, is filled with this kind of... Um, uh, conflict within herself, but the way she handles it is she always refers to asking questions. And she asks him not just the obvious questions, but well, why did you go back to Budapest? And uh, she knows relatively little about his life when he was living as a young man in Budapest. Uh, so th there was um, that kind of uh, uh, question. Then when she enters uh, the house, um, it's filled with lots of bedrooms, and all the bedrooms are filled with file cabinets. And some of them are computer uh, related, and some of them are related to her journey uh, going both to where she had the sex change and to the parts of the world that she spent parts of her life before coming to the United States. Um, uh, Hungarian is, uh, for those who may or may not know the language, is not part of the Indo-European uh, system of languages. It's one of those uh, um, spurs that comes somewhere from the Tartar area, and it's not Indo-European. So a lot of the words uh, are sort of composites with strange alphabetic connections, like they do a Z-S form, and I don't know how to say it, but that's... The, huh? S. S. And uh, if you want to pronounce a name, you have to know all the little, uh, what do you call it, uh, accents, marks on them. Umlauts or whatever. Uh, okay. <laughs> so that that's, uh, was another thing. She didn't speak any uh, Hungarian, obviously. Um, and um, here's, here's something. Um, uh, whenever, as a child, I pressed my father on his Jewish heritage and its banishment from our suburban home, he would dismiss my questions with a vaguely regal wave of the hand and a look of withering condensation. Condensation. No, con condes condescension, I'm sorry. Not condensation. Condescension. Uh, that's not interesting, he'd say. Or one of his trademark conversational enders, a stupid thing. Later on, uh, my first visit to my father in Hungary, I asked why she'd changed the family name. In 1946, the Friedmans, that was his name before he changed it to Faludi. The Friedmans became the Faludis. It was 18 years, I was 18 years old when Istvan's uh, idea. Uh, my father chose Faludi, she told me, for two reasons. It was an old Magyar name. Magyars are supposed to be the tribe that settled in the area that's no, known geographically as Hungary. Um, um, Magyar name, meaning of the village. True Magyars hail from the countryside. And she'd seen it roll by on credits of so many Hungarian films, she adored it as a boy. Um, had she also shared the name Friedman, I asked, because it sounded Jewish. 
My question prompted her usual gestures. I changed it because I was Hungarian. She corrected herself, because I am Hungarian, 100% Hungarian. Uh, I, was some, uh, I was someone with only the vaguest idea with what it meant to be a Jew, who was nevertheless adamant that I was one. My father was someone reminded at every turn that she was a Jew, who was nevertheless adamant that her identity lay elsewhere. So this is one of the uh, seminal questions about uh, um, the, the person in question, the biography of the father. He was uh, born uh, in a Jewish family. Uh, at that time, they were um, very economically uh, well off. Uh, he was put in, you know, private schools and educated in the traditional ways. Um, but at some point, they had to declare that they were not just Jews, but they were Hungarians. And the, the question of nationalism came up when these people were so economically well off and yet did not have an identity because they didn't own land. Uh, they owned property, but they didn't own land. And so um, there was a, some kind of a rule that said that you can also call yourself Hungarian without having to say Hungarian Jew or this. And that was part of uh, the changes that would confront um, Istvan as he wed waded through the 30s and 40s uh, and the Second World War. And um, uh, there are several, several other things that I think are, are of interest. Um, and, and she goes into this historical thing, which would, um, I wouldn't say turn off, but it confuses the reader because um, she's becoming historical, and then she's becoming hysterical, <laughs> and then she's trying to rationalize all this, saying, what kind of a man is this father of mine, who's now a woman? And um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, one of the things in the discussions uh, has here, um, you can find everything on the internet, my father exalted. The longer we spent in the third floor garret viewing virtually, virtual non-reality, the more frantic I became to escape into the world beyond the perimeter. If I stood at the attic window and stretched on tiptoe, I could just make out over the chestnut and fruit trees and down the sloping hills and across the river, Pest. Uh, Buddha and Pest are two towns and they were on opposite sides of the Danube River, um, close to uh, Vienna, but not, not, not right across there. Um, that fabled cos cosmo cosmopolis, the historical venue of so much creative and cultural ferment. At the turn of the century, Pest had been host to a spectacular upwelling of artists, writers, musicians, whose works had packed the museums and bookstalls and concert halls, who'd painted and scribbled and composed in 600 coffee houses, published in 22 daily newspapers and more than a dozen literary journals, filled more than 16,000 seats of the city's fast proliferating theaters and opera and operetta houses, transformed the identity of the long backward capital into the Paris of Eastern Europe. And um, this was uh, why he uh, wanted to come back to the, the Budapest that he knew. And that gave her some uh, idea of what was happening uh, as he made his transformations. Um, uh, so this was all part of how, how do you reconnect with a person who was your father, at least biologically, genetically, and maybe even politically, but who now lives in a, a different lifestyle, especially in light of the fact that um, the author uh, was so wedded on dealing with femininity in the 21st century. And so she, she talks a little bit about this. and. Uh, uh, let me see if I read this thing here. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, history of the Magyar um, that everybody had to learn when he was growing up, mainly because it was a uh, problem with uh, uh, dealing with the authorities 
who were gradually moving out of the Soviet sphere into the idea of a modern uh, socialist democracy. Okay, um, uh, it talks about uh, appearance. My father gave me one of her you-know-nothing looks. It was the best time, she said, the best time for the Jews. Her history was, wasn't so Pollyanna. From 1867, passage of Jewish Emancipation Act, granting Jews civic and political equality until the 1920 signing of the Treaty of Trianon, which is the Treaty of Versailles, an extraordinary set of circumstances led to, quote, the golden age of Hungarian Jewry. The era yielded a spectacular opportunity for the bourgeois Jewish population, an unprecedented acceptance for a significant subset of the country's Jews in that period. It seemed possible to be 100% Hungarian. Our family was among them. A century before my father changed genders, her forebearers had crossed another seemingly unbreachable border. And her parents came from um, um, two parts of what was then Hungary, I guess, or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And one was in Czechoslovakia, in the Slovakia part, and the other was in the Budapest part. So there were two families uh, of, of economic stature that met and thought that the daughters of the family uh, in one place would match up well with the sons of the family from the other place. And in those days, uh, dowries were very important. And so since they were very well off, um, uh, the, the father of, of uh, Stephanie's mother um, uh, gave a dowry to um, the uh, son of the freedman father and uh, his name was Yeno, Janos, I guess, Janos, and uh, Rosalia was her name. And so they had one of those traditional marriages uh, with two very important families at that time. Uh, and um, uh, Rosalia and Jenna had only one child uh, during that period, and that was uh, Istvan, who became Stephanie. And so he talks about uh, where they came from and how they were together. Um, and um, uh, what, what Susan proceeds to do over time is find some of the relatives of these families who had, after the war, survived uh, the Holocaust and moved into Switzerland or moved into Israel and uh, learn about how the family um, treated, uh, were treated during that period. And um, it also gave Susan a chance to know something about her family that he never talked about. That is, who were her grandparents? And where are they now? And where were they at that time? And um, so it goes on for at least uh, two or three uh, individual chapters as he unfolds the odyssey of his transformation. And he has huge files of pictures uh, that he shares with her and uh, various other things. And he doesn't lay everything out in one, one evening, so to speak. He does it in stages because he's not sure whether his daughter really will understand and appreciate the depth of his journey. And so it goes on and on here. And um, I um, wanted to read another quote of, uh, uh, of hers. When he comes back, he has made some context. Now, I should point out that he goes to a place called Phuket, which is in Thailand. And in this place, a doctor has set up um, his practice to do these changing operations. And because the price was right and the quality was supposedly good, uh, he decided to go there. And uh, in the process of doing that, he meets a lot of other people that he didn't know about who were also on the same journey. And one of them was a person who went by the name of Melanie. And Melanie was a sex change person. Um, and um, 
he became friends of her because he stayed at her guest house. Uh, Melanie had um, amassed some money and decided that it would be nice to have a guest house for all the people who had surgery uh, and now recovering from that surgery, which is not an easy thing to do. And her uh, place in Phuket was a great place to meet uh, other people and uh, start the healing process before they return to wherever they were coming back to. Um, uh, I want to read a, a quote from uh, Melanie and uh, the conversation that Melanie has with Susan. And this is back in Portland, uh, Oregon. Uh, she moves both from Europe back to the States periodically uh, as she uncovers material. And uh, it gets a little confusing to the average reader uh, where, where she's at and for whom she's speaking and why. And so I'm going to read this piece to you because uh, Melanie says, I'm not sure whether I'll be dressed as a woman or a man. They're supposed to be meeting at a cafe somewhere in Portland, Oregon. And uh, she doesn't know what he's going to look like. Uh, and uh, um, it said, Melanie had, had been male until three years earlier when he had gone to Thailand uh, to get some operation as my father uh, with uh, the same surgeon. Melanie now lived part of the year in Portland, her hometown. Call, um, call Melanie, my father advised. She's practically down the street from you. Uh, she would make a good interview for your book. The rest of the year, Melanie lives in Phuket, Thailand, where she ran Melanie's Cocoon, a guest house for post-operative transsexuals recovering from surgery. My father stayed there for several weeks after her sex reassignment surgery. Melanie had been in the scene for my father's transit from one sex to another. I'd only known my father as before and after. Suburban uber patriarch or ultra femme housefrau, separated by an empty moat of many years, Melanie knew the in-between. If I were searching for the fluidity in my father's story, as opposed to the either or, Melanie might bear witness to my father's most liminal moments. Uh, I scanned the cafe. Did this woman in a dress look like someone who was once a man? Uh, did that man in a suit look like a former man who had become a woman and was an hour man trying to pass as a man, or while everyone seemed to be in drag? Another quarter of an hour went by. The door of cafe people swung open to admit a middle-aged man or quotes man in a shaggy crew cut, wire-rimmed oval glasses, striped blue men's dress shirt and khaki pants. He had a round face and a charming gap between his front teeth that reminded me of Lauren Hutton's. He hesitated for a few steps inside the door and then looked around. I stood up, deliberated, are you? To my relief, he nodded and came over. Uh, I'm going by Mel now, he says, and then they have a conversation, and he tries to relate something about uh, her father's time in Phuket at this coconut place where he was recuperating from the surgery. Um, and um, he gets the impression that, uh, that um, Stephanie um, is uh, hurting more than normally when the sop operation is, is over with. And he tries to make contact with her, but she's not prepared to open up. She's still pretty much uh, closed about who she should talk to, what she should tell those people about, because she has fears that some of those people might be retaliating. I mean, that paranoia that comes when you make a major shift in your life and then you go into a foreign environment not knowing anything about the other people except they did the same thing that you did. And so um, what Mel is trying to do is tell uh, Susan about her father's stay and some of the impressions he left or she left with him. Um, 
One of the things that Mel talks about, and this is, uh, gets into the notions of how, how many of these uh, people, and, and there are, most of the emphasis in this case is on the males who want to change their biology. Um, there are also females who want to do similar things, and it's not quite as easy, but there is some uh, allusion to that kind of thing, as later on in the book she points out. Um, and Mel talks about one of the things um, that he did. And I want to read that passage because it's indicative of the kind of uh, um, not only economic uh, need uh, for people who want to do this kind of operation, uh, but the important thing is to create an image uh, that reflects the biology that you really want, which is buying back into what I call the, the, the binary, the gender binary. You know, male, masculine, uh, female, feminine, and all the things that social um, uh, etiquette and, and also social development bring out, out in our gender roles. Okay, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done the surgery if I couldn't have the face, Mel said. I could never be a clown. If I'm going to be seen in women's clothes, I'm, I'm going to be genuine. I had one of the best facial surgeons in the country, a Dr. Douglas Osterhout in San Francisco. He practically invented what's called facial feminization surgery. They say he based it all on his one ideal woman. Later, I looked up Osterhout on the internet and find before and after photos of his patients, YouTube promotional videos, and patient testimonials to his magic touch. A web shot, a web, <laughs> what is it now? A website developed and run by Diane, one of his former patients, uh, achieving your dream and enabling you to pass as a woman that you are. Dr. Osterhout will try to improve your appearance so that you will feel that you fit back into society as the person you want to see in the mirror. It cost $32,000, Mel said, for the face surgery, I mean. He spent tens of thousands more on breast and genital surgery, hair implants, speech therapy, and extensive new wardrobe. I was like the poster child for best trans person in Portland. And um, so that's how she's getting insight into the phenomenon. And then in the second part of the book, she spends a good deal of time, okay, um, uh, talking about um, the uh, questions about gender, um, it, both in the United States and in uh, pre-war Germany. What I thought about this book when I heard first the interview was that this was a very, very strange case because um, many of the people who go for the surgery are usually in their 40s or 50s. You can't afford to go to this thing unless you have a close to 70 to $80,000 with all the different surgery parts. And so that he did this at 76 must have been a, sort of a strange phenomenon to, to know where he got the money to do that. He was a very successful uh, photo uh, touching uh, photographer, uh, but he was claiming some of the wealth that the Germans and later the Hungarian and the Soviets took away from their families before the wars as a result of the Treaty of Versailles. So uh, part of what um, she does is to look at what is the source of all of this transgender stuff? And she goes to talk about two main characters uh, in this um, 20th century uh, quest for gender parity. And one of them is a guy named Harry Benjamin, who was a surgeon uh, who uh, came from uh, uh, Germany uh, escaped the Nazis and lived uh, as a, and, and practiced in New York City as an endocrinologist. And um, he began to look at some of the work that's been done on endocrinology and body change. And so gradually he got interested in helping people who wanted uh, in the worst way to change their biology. And hormones were one of the avenues to do that. And so he developed a whole uh, profile of what 
gender diversity is and transgenders and so forth, and those who wanted to go for surgery who were also transsexual. And again, um, we have a, a, a handout that I'll give you in a minute or so uh, about all the terminology that has been used and continues to uh, create maybe uh, questions about uh, that. Joel is going to hand that out to everybody right now. Um, the uh, <clears throat> other thing about this was that um, Dr. Benjamin meets the other man who was in Germany at the time the Nazis came to power. And he was a sexologist. His name was Magnus Hirschfeld. And Hirschfeld learned also about the use of hormones to change one's uh, biology to some extent or influence one's biology. Uh, but his attitude was uh, that uh, people who want to pre present a different gender role should be able to do so without feeling either social ostracization or uh, what my friends call the tyranny of social expectation. And that is, if you expect somebody to be and look and feel the way you anticipate, uh, then you should have uh, no problem recognizing that. What um, what um, um, Dr. Hirschfeld was, was for tolerance of variance and, and not necessarily uh, using what is called the binary model or that is born a male, you uh, develop a boy and then masculine and then manhood. Uh, born a female, you develop feminine and then female, uh, then uh, womanhood and um, then whatever roles that go with that. Um, in, in this part of her book, she focuses on the notion of identity, because in her other books, she's also talked about identity, but only from the point of view of uh, social expectation and not about the, uh, maybe the biological issues associated with them. But face it, um, w when women go for or have uh, mastectomies, uh, it's like losing their, f their, their, their female bodies because a good part of their body is developed uh, in the upper part of the chest. And if you lose that, you lose some part of your what is believed to be your femaleness. That's a debatable point, but women who've had it done uh, can tell you uh, that it is not an easy uh, a shift. So her role in, in, in this middle part of the book was to look at identity from various points of view. And she's not strictly an academic about it, but her research is really a, a insightful journalism. Somebody who really wants to understand what's behind this idea of gender shift or gender options. And uh, are we really uh, uh, victims of anatomy, uh, as it was as quoted earlier? In an issue um, um, uh, of the National Geographic in January of this year, there's a whole issue about gender and some of the things that we, we sort of assume about gender that may or may not be known to a lot of people. I recommend, uh, if you have a chance to look at it, the library has copies of, of uh, the National Geographic. The January issue has that. And these uh, um, lists that I uh, we had handed out come from that book. It's from a, um, a, um, a book called The Gender Toolkit. It's mostly for healthcare professionals who work with gender populations um, uh, and either refer them to endocrinologists or to people who will be candidates for surgery. Um, the other uh, thing that, that is really interesting about this is uh, toward the uh, latter part of the book, we focus on how the father who leaves his family goes then uh, to Denmark. Um, no, actually, he doesn't do, leave his family. He, he leaves Budapest uh, right after the war, able to escape the Nazis, travel by car, or by whatever vehicle, uh, all the way to the border between Germany and Denmark, and then is accepted in Denmark as a photographer who's doing a study <coughs> of Danish life under the Nazis. 
was an amazing uh, coup for this guy, but it, it launched his career as a photographer. And he came, he went with a very dear friend, and they uh, eluded the Germans, uh, even going through Austria and parts of uh, what, what, is, what is known then as, now as West Germany, but that was the part that was not uh, where the war was taking place. And um, so, uh, uh, he goes to Denmark, he spends two years there, and um, he also gets a contract to go to Brazil. And in Brazil is where he develops some uh, really unique photographic techniques to uh, do the cartography related to how the state of Brazil is uh, composed geologically. And then he comes to America and he gets this job, I guess ultimately as a photo specialist with Life magazine uh, and does some of the touch-up photography for that. Um, the, the internet uh, then takes over and IBM uh, hires him to be their official photographer, uh, touching up photos of Watson and whoever else was important at that point. And that's where he meets his wife and that's where he has his children. He has one son and daughter, Susan. Uh, but Susan um, uh, loses contact with the father when he uh, has to leave the household uh, because he's been abusive to his wife and uh, he's, n he's never been in touch with her until 2004. And that's how this book opens up. Um, the other thing that's really interesting um, as, as she got to know him more and, and how, how he managed to live his life as a woman in post-Soviet, uh, post I guess, Hungary, um, he presented uh, very, various aspects of, of some of the motivation. And part of it was that he lived a really multi-tiered life before the wars. And when the, uh, not the Nazis so much, but all of the fascists who were against the Jews, the anti-Semite people, um, would, would gang up on, on these Jewish people. And he learned two things. One, either uh, uh, join them or you avoid them. And what he did, because he was a unique character, he played ball with the um, Hungarian, I wouldn't call them mafia, but they were the, uh, the equivalent of the Gestapo in Hungary. And he was able to uh, do some subterfuge, which is uh, well documented in the book, uh, to get his parents out of the uh, deportation centers that were sending the Jews of Hungary to uh, Auschwitz. It's a wonderful story to, to, to anecdote. Um, uh, there was some credibility to it because some of the relatives had uh, uh, verified that um, Istvan, or Pista as he was called, uh, did save his parents. And they were able to get to Israel. Um, uh, it ends uh, in the last visit, uh, he's now sick. Uh, whatever his illness is, uh, it's not, nothing to do with the surgery, but uh, he, he now is feeling old age creep up on him. And he's in the hospital when she comes to visit the last time, and um, she's too late. Uh, he died about two days before she arrived in Budapest. Um, it, it sounds sad, but she doesn't appear sad in this. Uh, she had more things she wanted to unfold with this man, but she learned enough about him to know that this was a very complicated uh, life pattern. Um, and the transsexual part of it was only a piece. And uh, her stories about how the Jews were treated uh, between the two world wars uh, are really well documented. She's got good references to some of the stuff about the sexual re reassignment. Um, she's a very competent writer, and I would recommend, if you haven't read this book, to read uh, pieces of it to get an idea of the, the intellect and the emotionalism of a daughter trying to understand her father. Thank you very much.
Her talks about identity here are really well worth a read. Even if you read that section of the book, you'll get insights into four kinds of identity, national identity, gender identity, sexual identity, and Jewish identity. Now, this is a really complex person, but that's what's wrapped up in this book. Um, and the geographic does some of this, but it goes beyond just Europe. Um, it talks about what they do in uh, Africa, what they do in other parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, gender is not an easy topic to deal with. And um, if you don't have to deal with it, uh, you're better off in some ways. Uh, um, uh, I mentioned some things about Susan. She is now a freelance writer living in Maine with her husband, who is a professor of English uh, at, at Bowdoin College, which is one of the small colleges in uh, Portland area of Maine. Um, and uh, as I heard her talk, uh, uh, her life is just beginning. You know, she's very excited about all the things that she can do because she's a, a liberated woman in many, many ways. Um, and she's worth reading regardless of what sex you, you deal with here uh, because she's lucid. She's uh, clear about some of the things and she's detailed. She doesn't just say, I am who I am, blah, blah. The, the final thing I'd like to leave with uh, the people who uh, sp were willing to spend a, an hour with me. Uh, first, uh, the epithet, uh, sex is between your legs and gender is between your ears, as you think about it. And uh, a very good friend of mine uh, gave me that quote about 25 years ago. The second um, is a uh, quote that I got from Christine. Christine Jorgensen was the first well-announced uh, transsexual. Lots of stories about her and then about the backlash of her. And her main thing, anatomy is destiny. And her answer was anatomy is not destiny because she wanted to change her biology. Uh, the last uh, few things, uh, one is, um, and that's what I liked about Susan and all the things that I do touch my hand to, an unexamined life has little meaning. And uh, it comes out of uh, the times of Socrates and Plato. But they, they questioned everything uh, that one would do about one's life and came to some conclusions. And, and, uh, but they examined the issues, and, and that's important. Um, then a history uh, thing, I, I either got it from Santayana or something. Those who do not study history are condemned to repeat the past. And we see this, and uh, you could see it in, in some of the issues that Susan has raised. And the last is a statement my friend who's a sociologist always says, there is tyranny associated with social expectation. Uh, and, and you see that with the, 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 the latest of the, the bull, I call them papal bulls, but they're presidential bulls uh, from Washington uh, about the transsexual bathroom issue. I mean, what, um, what are we getting, it's crazy. Absolute madness. The tyranny of social expectation. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>